have you join us today. And uh, let me just point out that we're going to be taking questions in order of seniority. We've got a hybrid, so we may have some folks on um, coming virtually, but we're going to do it in order of seniority, and that way we don't have to worry about when people signed on to the virtual uh, screen. So very nice to be here with my ranking member, Senator Moran, and with the chair of the Appropriations Committee, Senator Leahy, and my neighbor. So nice of you to join us this afternoon. The Subcommittee on Commerce, Justice, Science, and Related Agencies will officially come to order, and we welcome everyone to today's hearing. I had a chance last week when I was in New Hampshire to meet with the New Hampshire Municipal Association to hear from towns all over the state about what their most pressing infrastructure needs are. And I'm sure it will come as no surprise to anyone here that the list that communities have is very long, but at the top of that list is access to reliable, affordable internet. In New Hampshire, like in every other state around the country, you can't fully participate in American life without reliable high-speed internet. Just ask the parent of any school-aged child about navigating schools during the pandemic, about ask any small business owner trying to compete or anyone trying to schedule a well visit with their local doctor. The pandemic laid bare what has been true, that broadband like water and electricity is a necessity. And I know that we all heard stories from families in our states about having to go to McDonald's to get access to the internet because their kids couldn't get access for school. By some estimates, more than 40 million Americans don't have access to broadband. Those without access are disproportionately low-income individuals, and in a country like the United States, this just should not be the case. In November, the President signed into law the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, a landmark bill that invests $65 billion to expand broadband in our country. And of that amount, nearly $50 billion will be administered by the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, or NTIA, within the Department of Commerce and under the jurisdiction of this subcommittee. A fortunate occurrence for all of the members of the subcommittee and one that my ranking member pointed out to me very early. Together, these programs will be used to deploy broadband to unserved and underserved locations, create more low-cost broadband service options, install middle-mile infrastructure, and address the digital equity and inclusion needs in our community. I think it's worth pausing to note that this bill's passage is due in no, no small part to the tireless work of many of the members of this subcommittee. In particular, our ranking member, Senator Moran, as well as Senators Manchin, Collins, Coons, Murkowski, Graham, um, and Capito, I think, all deserve recognition as they all participated in the group effort to negotiate this law. I'd especially like to thank Senator Collins, who led the bipartisan broadband working group with me, Senator Collins, Collins and also um, would be remiss not to thank you, Madam Secretary, because without your leadership and your consistent engagement with us, we would not be here today. So thank you very much. There is still so much more work to do, as we all know. And as you can expect, my colleagues and I on the subcommittee are eager to see this money get out the door and to our states. We know the release of funding is largely contingent on the release of FCC maps, and I recognize that that's not within your direct control. But we look forward to hearing an update from you about the mapping process and when you think those will be ready. Beyond questions of timing, I've also heard questions from my state about the difficulty in navigating so many federal and state broadband initiatives. These programs often overlap and they have different requirements. Cities and towns across New Hampshire are looking for assurances that there will be effective coordination among states and the various federal agencies administering broadband programs. That coordination will be very important to serve more people and stretch our dollars further. We also know that creating low-cost options for reliable high-speed internet is crucial. We look forward to hearing how the department plans to work with states to develop these proposals as mandated by the bipartisan infrastructure law. 
These challenges are just the tip of the iceberg, but I would like you, Madam Secretary, to know that we on the subcommittee stand ready to assist the department as it executes these investments. We all know the stakes. Effectively managed, it is no exaggeration to say that these investments will transform the lives of tens of millions of Americans. Madam Secretary, we know you understand the stakes as well, and we very much look forward to your testimony this afternoon. With that, let me recognize the ranking member, member Senator Moran, for his opening remarks. Senator Shaheen, thank you. Thank you very much for convening this hearing. Uh, it is uh, timely. I'm pleased that we're doing this in advance of the decisions that uh, NTIA and the Department of Commerce will make as they execute the authorities that we've granted them in the bipartisan bill. And I appreciate always when I see an appropriations subcommittee and appropriations committee uh, engaged in overseeing uh, the activities of the agencies and departments that we fund. And Secretary Raimondo, I, I welcome you to this, uh, your first appearance before the CJS subcommittee in 2022, and I look forward to working with you in this new year. Uh, I think your insight as a governor, a former governor, is something will be of great value in, in this particular arena, but in many aspects of the job you hold at the Department of Commerce. The Infrastructure and Investment uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act gives the department authority over $48 billion in taxpayer dollars for broadband programs. These programs cover everything from enabling states to connect unserved areas to furthering connectivity for tribes to strengthening the backbone of infrastructure that will make our goal of increasing access possible. The, gen the department is at the forefront of this once-in-a-generation investment. And I really do hope that this is the, the time in which we are done saying this is the moment in which we're going to get speed and interconnectivity to places that are underserved and unserved uh, in this country. Uh, we cannot continue to have uh, new programs, uh, additional billions of dollars over and over and over again while our constituents, while America waits for the, the valuable use of the internet. Despite the significant funding allocated for broadband deployment, it will still be a challenge to meet those goals. Uh, we must make certain that federal funds are well coordinated and do not contribute to overbuilding of existing networks while some Americans would continue to lack access to broadband altogether. I hear often from Kansas broadband providers about the various challenges facing them when it comes to deployment. One provider told me recently that a group of 19 families in rural Ellsworth County, Kansas, have been asking for service to be built out to their farms for years with the promise that they would subscribe to that service. Unfortunately, the area remains a, quote, pending location under the FCC's Rural Digital Opportunity Fund, RDOF, auction. Highlights the challenges that when we pass legislation, it still doesn't mean that broadband shows up in places across our states. It highlights the challenges that states face on working to plan to reach the unserved, and they wait upon updated maps and attempts to navigate the myriad of broadband programs that the chairwoman uh, mentioned. I recently had a conversation with Stanley Adams. He's the director of the Kansas Office of Broadband Development. Uh, implementation of these programs is going to be an enormous challenge. Uh, my goal in having my co conversation with him and our conversation with you today is to see if we can't get those on the ground uh, involved with those who are making decisions about how the, the deployment should occur. Having said all those challenges, I'm excited about this opportunity. A significant reason I asked Kansans to give me the chance to represent them was a belief in rural America, and one of the components of taking care of rural America to see that it has a bright future is the access to broadband. Fundamentally, the department needs to be a partner, and NTIA must work to understand the situation on the ground in Kansas and in each state. NTIA will play a significant role in certifying that families across rural Kansas and other rural areas, maybe those are words that are written on a piece of paper. It is rural Kansas, but it's also many other places that we wouldn't consider rural. The core parts of cities uh, in Kansas and across the country are in desperate need of broadband as well. We know that each state will have its own unique problems. Uh, the challenges in Kansas might be different than the challenges in New Hampshire, but whatever those differences are, Senator Sheen and I will overcome, and we'll see that our goal of broadband access is the same. Both NTIA and states will need to ensure they have the right people to provide expertise, 
ensure an effective, complete build-out, and oversee the significant investments for today. A lot of work to be done. NTIA, I'm sure, will be challenged by the scope and scale, but all of this must be done right and the resources applied appropriately and effectively. Uh, please know that I stand ready to work with you as we connect the nation. I thank you for being here today. Thank you, Senator Moran. Chairman Leahy, would you like to make any remarks before I call on the Secretary? No, no, I'm just, I'm interested in hearing it. I, I'm one of those that lives in a rural area on a dirt road, five miles from our state capitol building, and there are days that my broadband, I pay the highest amount there is, there are actually some days it works. <laughs> Not often, but uh, some days. And our, mainly because the company doesn't give a damn about uh, last mile stuff, but we'll get into that. Okay, I thought maybe you were here to give us an update that we have an agreement on an omnibus, no? Uh, I'll tell you about that after. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Secretary Ramondo. Uh, good afternoon, good afternoon. Chair Shaheen, Ranking Member Moran, members of the committee, thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to this discussion and it's nice to see you all in person. Um, as the chairwoman said very eloquently, too many families all across America can't afford the cost of broadband service or, uh, as the chairman just said, they live in areas that don't have access to high-speed internet. And gaps in broadband mean gaps in opportunity. Fewer opportunities to learn and work from home, to visit the doctor, to stay connected with family and friends. Achieving an equitable future means ensuring that all homes, all businesses, have high quality connections at affordable prices and that users have the devices and digital skills they need for meaningful use. The truth is our economy can't fully recover unless all Americans can fully participate. That's exactly why President Biden set an ambitious goal when he entered office. That goal is crystal clear. Connect every single American through affordable, reliable, high-speed broadband. I, too, would like to thank the members of this committee, both Democrat and Republican, who worked with us to negotiate the broadband provisions of the bipartisan infrastructure law. I specifically want to thank Madam Chair, Senator Manchin, Senator Collins, Senator Murkowski, and each and every one of you. I've worked with each and every one of you to negotiate this, and I cannot thank you enough for your cooperation and making this a reality. Because of your work and your commitment to bipartisanship, this law provides $65 billion to deliver reliable high-speed internet to every American, lower the cost of internet, and close the digital divide. Of those funds, as Ranking Member Moran said, $48.2 billion are allocated to the Commerce Department's National Telecommunication and Information Administration, NTIA. Specifically, that law provides $42.5 billion for the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program, which I'll refer to as BEAD in this testimony, $2 billion for tribal broadband grants, $2.75 billion to fund the Digital Equity Act, and $1 billion specifically for middle mile connections to build a high-speed backbone. Our goal at the Commerce Department is to make certain that at the end of our work, every single household, small business, farm, family, and student in America has access to affordable, reliable, high-speed broadband. And we're focused on getting this done right and giving states the flexibility they need to ensure that this benefits everyone in their state. As the ranking member mentioned, I am a former governor and I lived this. I lived this. The needs of Rhode Island for broadband are different than Kansas or New Hampshire or Maine or Vermont or Delaware or West Virginia. It is different. And so we have to have flexibility to get the job done. In many rural communities, there is no broadband. No fiber, doesn't exist. So in that case, our task ahead is to lay the infrastructure and ensure people in even the most rural corners of the country can get online. In urban areas, 
it is a different set of challenges. On tribal lands, a different set of challenges. So the way we are administering this program um, is with great flexibility. And the law, as conceived, has built in flexibility to allow us to address each state's specific needs. If I deliver no other message today, I want to be clear, there is, we do not have a one-size-fits-all approach because I don't believe that would be successful. We are going to work hand in glove very closely with your states to fund projects that will make the greatest impact and achieve universal broadband access and affordability. This unprecedented investment in closing the digital divide requires input from a wide range of voices to assist our design and implementation of the new grant programs. I cannot say this enough. Stakeholder engagement is absolutely vital to getting this done. And thanks to the historic and bipartisan investments that you've made and enabled, we're moving towards our goal of connecting all Americans to affordable high-speed broadband. We all know that for our economy, businesses, and workers to be competitive in the 21st century economy, we have to get this done. So, uh, like many of you, I am eager to work with you. That Ranking Member Moran is exactly right. This will not be easy. This is detail-oriented. This is complicated implementation hurdle. We, together, in partnership with states and tribes um, and stakeholders, will get this done and fundamentally close the digital divide in America. So thank you. Well, thank you very much, Madam Secretary. Um, we will now have a round of five-minute questions, and as I said, we will go in seniority order on the committee um, with some people coming virtually. I will begin. As we all referenced in our opening statements, this is funding that we want to see get out the door, and the timing is really going to be dependent on a number of things, but you mentioned the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment, the BEAD program, which is really dependent on the creation of those FCC maps. And the concern that we have in New Hampshire is not just when that's going to happen, but also how accurate those maps are going to be. And I can tell you previous maps that we've seen in our state, and I'm sure everybody has a similar story, have not been accurate. They have not shown where the dead spots are and where the coverage really needs to be. So can you speak at all recognizing that this is not your direct area of uh, responsibility, but can you speak to what's happening with the FCC and completing those maps? Because so much of what needs to happen depends on when we get those and how accurate they're going to be. Yeah. So as you say, the, the maps are vital. I mean, Senator Moran mentioned overbuilding. The mission here, as explicitly laid out in the statute, is to prioritize unserved. At the end of this, shame on us, on me, if there's anyone unserved left. So the maps will tell us who's unserved and who's underserved. And, and that's why we can't, I can't, we can't deploy any of this money until we have the accurate maps. As, as you say, this is not, this is in the purview of the FCC. I will tell you we are in constant communication with the FCC. I have spoken with the chairwoman myself. I've met with her. Alan Davidson, newly confirmed, thank you, uh, is already in contact with her. We have been, uh, they, they represent that probably summer, you know, this summer, they will have the maps. Um, I will say this, I do have confidence they will be, you know, more accurate than in the past. The past, they've been broad, you know, by census tract. These are down to the household, and we're incorporating our census data from the Commerce Department into the maps. But for a more detailed answer, I, I would, def, you know, refer you to the chairwoman of the FCC. Thank you. I appreciate that. Can you, um, obviously, one of the other aspects of that is what the challenge process might be if there's concern about accuracy. Can you speak to what the department's thinking about in terms of any kind of a challenge process on those? I, I think that, you know, again, that's, that this really is in the FCC's purview. Our role is take the maps, run it through the statutory formula, get the state allocation, and then run the program. But I think there will have to be some, you know, challenge process simply because 
as I said before, we do have to listen to every stakeholder. And it's $65 billion. Mm -hmm. Like I've told my team, it's better, like, yes, you have to go fast, but you really have to get it right. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, as I said in my opening remarks, sort of jokingly, but it was serious because in drafting this legislation, we did choose the NTIA to lead the program because of its crucial coordination role with other federal agencies, and in particular with the FCC, with the USDA. NTIA maintains regular contact with states through their state broadband offices. So how, how do you does the NTIA plan to address those coordination issues? And can, can you assure states that there will be some opportunity for input as you're developing these plans? Yes, absolutely. So um, a few thoughts. It is true, as you say, you know, the USDA has some money here, Interior does, Treasury does, we do. Uh, our goal is to to the extent possible, have NTIA be like one-stop shop. We cannot be asking governors and mayors and tribal leaders to deal with the alphabet soup of government. We have to make it easy. So the way we plan to do this is um, we're gonna have a single point person at NTIA in charge of every state, one person. So I know when I wanna know everything about New Hampshire, I go to the New Hampshire person. Um, Right now, we're in the middle of intense stakeholder engagement. In fact, we have a request for comment, which is open right now. Um, I spent the weekend with the governors at the Governors Association, the weekend before with the mayors at the Conference of Mayors. We are doing everything we know how to do to encourage robust stakeholder engagement. Um, the last thing I'll say is the way this is going to work is every state has to give us a state plan, which will be made public. We are requiring them in that plan to lay out all the federal monies they're using for broadband so we can see it all in one place. Great. Thank you. I'm out of time. I have lots more questions, but I know that many of my colleagues will get to those. So, Senator Moran. Chairman, thank you. Um, Secretary Raimondo, let me talk about the funding formula. Uh, the initial uh, bead program as an initial $100 million to each state, followed by an amount to be to be determined by unserved areas in the state. Uh, the purpose of the formula is to provide the states with the most with the most unserved areas with the most funding, something I fully agree with. One issue that I foresee is the uncertainty regarding whether currently unserved areas are still going to be considered unserved if a separate federal broadband program like the FCC's RDOF has awarded funding for those areas, but a network has not yet been built out. It creates the risk that some states could lose out on a significant amount of money as RDOF awards cover broad swaths of some of, those, some of our states. The risk is compounded if previously identified projects ultimately fail, uh, fails to deliver the money, RDOF money. So, a, a concern I raise with you is, does RDOF, where they intend to go but haven't gone, does that eliminate that area from being unserved? Will there be, maybe that's, maybe, maybe there's a response from you before I go on. I, maybe it's just an issue to raise with you. Yeah, yeah. So you're saying RDOF is supposed to have covered these areas, hasn't yet, will they be counted as served in the map? Right, if, if, if those yeah. areas or those states get left out because RDOF may do something yeah. and hasn't done something, and I guess if the, if the word is they may do something, it's also they may not do something, right, right. we need to make sure that those broad swaths of areas of states across the country are not excluded. I understand. First of all, I agree fully and completely. Again, my job is to make sure everyone is covered at the end of this. By the way, this is exactly why we're doing so much stakeholder engagement and why we're obsessed with getting to people on the ground, which is what I told the governors. I don't have a, I have to look into this and talk to the FCC and get back to you. And I promise you I will do that. We'll follow, my staff will follow up with you. Um, by the way, it's exactly this sort of excruciating detail that we are in the middle of figuring out, which is why these engagements and requests for comment are so important. It is a reason I'm so pleased Senator Shaheen has the, is called this hearing now. Yeah, uh, yes, instead yes. Instead of after the fact. Yeah, I would say many of the policy decisions, uh, of which there are many, 
we, ha we are in the process of figuring out how to implement, and that's why we're doing this request for comment now. So I will follow up. Somewhat related to that, co my, my comment and, and your follow up is, is, does the department plan to calculate the funding allocations to states using any criteria be beyond the size of the unserved population? So the formula is, as, as you know in the statute, unserved. There's a 10% set aside for um, uh, places that are hard to reach and that are expensive. So that's additional on top of, on top of the formula. Um, and then we have the digital equity grants on top of that and then the middle mile on top of that. Um, I, I think my, my question, just to plant in your mind, is, is do, I, do I need to be concerned or that there's some definition of unserved beyond unserved? And maybe we'll see how that, I mean, I, I, no. Alaska is just totally unserved, right? <laughs> so we want to make state. sure that the unserved means the, the, that really it is unserved. Let me, let me before I lose my time, and I, <clears throat> I hope to have the uh, opportunity to ask some additional questions, I'm going to tell you the Kansas Broadband Development Office, and that's the person that I think you'll be your point person uh, in Kansas. Um, they have a staff of two. Mm. And their ability to have the resources necessary early on to do their job is important. The law outlines that how these offices can receive an initial amount of funding and dictates that the department aid these offices throughout the process of applying for a grant and executing the program. Uh, any explanation on what the department already plans to do to support state broadband offices during deployment and how can uh, NTIA allocate its resources to, to prepare to meet what will be a significant demand for technical assistance from the states? Yeah, 36 states have broadband offices uh, and they vary significantly in quality. The good news is NTIA has a long history of working with these states and has a pretty good feel for who needs more technical assistance. The way we're going to do this program is we're aiming towards a May 16th notice of funding opportunity. After that, the state has to give us a letter of intent that they want to participate. Then there's a $5 million planning grant, and that will then begin heavy technical assistance. And if you're telling me Kansas only has a couple of people, I would think that $5 million and heavy technical assistance will help shore them up. But they're very high quality people. I'm sure they are. Thank yes. you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would be happy to follow. I, we're out of time. I'd like to visit with you and get the details of, One, of wonderful. this. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Leahy. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Chair Shaheen. I, <clears throat> Governor, I, I keep finding myself calling you Governor. Madam Secretary, I'm delighted to have you here. I think... Uh, you heard in our, your state, actually every one of us heard in our states during the pandemic and schools being closed, uh, work being done remotely and all of that, that we had in a one year time, we had probably a 10 or 15 year change in society, how we needed uh, uh, broadband. We have a system in Vermont called Communications Union Districts, CUDs, it takes uh, communities near each other, can band together, they can identify, they can finance, they can fulfill local broadband infrastructure needs. And currently, 206 Vermont municipalities belong to one or more of these CUDs. That's 64% of the state's population, it's 91% of the unserved locations. And it's been seen as a pretty good model of how you get how you create community-owned entity to deliver broadband. Now, how, how can these Vermont CUDs benefit from the broadband provisions in the infrastructure law? And I ask that because if you have rural areas that do not have a extensive financial history, how can they plug in and be able to use uh, the, these new programs. Thank you. So, <clears throat> as I said in the beginning, the reason this program is structured this way is because there is no one size fits all. And in rural Vermont, we're going to have to have a different solution than in urban Rhode Island. Uh, nonprofits, municipally owned 
co-ops or utilities are all eligible for these funds. And I, so your state uh, will have to put together a state plan, which we will have to approve. And based on what you're saying, it, it sounds like though the um, communications union districts would be included in the state plan, and depending on the details, could be eligible for funding. Um, we're trying to encourage competition. So we're asking every state to have a competitive process. Uh, we're requiring every provider who gets money to deliver an affordable plan. And I think in a lot of rural places, it will be the you know co-ops and well, municipalities that <clears throat> get the money. Yeah, I, I look at the fact, I mean, I can, on the many, 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 many times that the, my broadband service is not working, I can get in the car and drive five miles to my office in Montpelier and have perfect broadband. But not everybody can do that. If you're a, a child home from school, you can't. Um, inaccurate broadband maps have hindered our ability to build out our broadband infrastructure for years, if not decades. We try to update our um, data map. Would your department consider devising a mechanism that allows states to harmonize data maps so states like Vermont don't uh, lose any strategic advantage, use money with confidence by utilizing state maps that already exist? Well, the, the, I would say this. Now states should be looking at their maps, you know, getting ready, getting their teams ready, making sure the permitting in the state doesn't get in the way. But the maps that we have to use will be the FCC produced maps. Well, we should we should talk more about that because I want to make sure that these are accurate mm -hmm. everywhere. I mean, whether it's obviously in Rhode Island, New Hampshire, or Vermont, or, or Kansas, or anywhere else. Um, because you have the, the last mile broadband infrastructure, that's a significant obstacle, and most of our rural areas lack adequate access. There's $65 billion to make broadband available, including $42.5 billion for state broadband deployment. Um, we need coordination of maps. I don't expect you to have the magic answer right now, but coordination of maps that work and everything else, and some way of facilitating this last mile. Mm -hmm. So I said, I could, I can drive five miles to my office and have something that works every time. But if you're a child in school and whatnot, or an invalid or something else, you can't do that. Yeah, I agree fully and completely. And hopefully, you know, the reality is in a lot of these places, there hasn't it hasn't made economic sense for the ISPs to do that, and that's the whole point of using this money to make sure the last mile is covered everywhere. So I, I would look forward to following up with you. Thank you. Well, we'll continue to work with your office, and again, it's, it's a delight to see you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Leahy. Senator Murkowski. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Welcome, Madam Secretary. Good to see you. Thank you for all you are doing and for being so responsive um, on so many of the issues that we've had discussions about. So you're talking about the mapping and, and the last mile, as, as we have had uh, many discussions in, in Alaska, so much of our concern is with middle mile infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, we've, got, we've got good support within the infrastructure bill, a uh, billion dollars to deploy middle mile projects, so we're excited about that. But um, a couple questions on that, one specific to the mapping. Uh, I've, I've got a little bit of concern about the mapping requirements versus the timeliness of, of getting the funds out the door. Everyone wants to get the money out the door, but making sure that we have actually accurate maps I think is gonna be critical, particularly for us in ensuring the intent of the law to serve the unserved before the underserved is met. And so it's gonna take, we think, a little bit of time to, to do it right. We understand the urgency, but what I'm hoping is that we can get some assurance that NTIA is gonna be 
sensitive to the diverse needs that we have in different states to get to the right solutions here. And you know, maybe this requires a little bit of a flexibility, a little bit of interagency coordination, but we would hope that you're understanding uh, some of the challenges that we face in a state like Alaska. Yes, I do. I mean, you and I have spoken about this. Alaska is unique, having said that most of all these states are, but I understand the massive geography, the difficult topography, not that many people. Um, we're not going to put the money out before we have the maps. Okay. We won't. We can't. You know, as I said, there'll be the $5 million planning grant, and we'll get to work, but we can't let the money flow until we have the maps. So, and I appreciate what you have shared, but I also know that I'm going to have people back home that are going to be panicked because they're going to see other regions of the country that might be um, receiving awards first and figure, wait, we're going to get left behind again. What we want to be able to assure is we're moving with urgency, we're, doing, we're, we're getting the accuracy that we need for this mapping, and, and again, we're paying attention to this middle mile. Yeah, I understand. Um, well, we'll do more stakeholder engagement. I mean, I think there's no substitute for communication and continuing to communicate with the message that you say. I will say that um, you mentioned there's the billion dollar set aside for Middle Mile, which is true. But Alaska can choose to spend its bead money on Middle Mile as well. So if the Alaska broadband plan identifies Middle Mile um, as the biggest problem, I would expect they'll use much of their bead money to build out Middle Mile, plus, like you said, the yeah. Middle Mile. Let, let me turn to, to tribal broadband and the, the connectivity uh, program. I'm, I'm going to submit for the record a letter that the Alaska delegation sent uh, to you, Madam Secretary, regarding the Alaska-based projects that are under consideration for the tribal broadband um, connectivity. Um, you mentioned that there was $980 million in funding. This program had over $5 billion in application by the deadline last September. Uh, we've got an additional $2 billion in funding through the infrastructure uh, bill. But obviously, the need is, is extraordinary out there. Um, so I'm hoping that you can answer just a, a few just procedural questions here. Um, with the additional $2 billion that is, is coming for the TBCP, do projects that have already been approved for funding but haven't yet received any money, do they need to resubmit their applications? And, and if so, how are you communicating that with folks? Do you have additional staff that you've added? Um, how, how, are you, how are you letting yeah. people know about the availability here? So uh, we are still figuring out the specific answer to your question, which is do they have to reapply? Right. I think you're, there's a lot of sense in making them not reapply for the reasons that you said, but we're going through it, and I'll have an answer shortly. Uh, we think we're going to have to hire over 100 people um, at NTIA to administer all of these programs. And as he said, there'll be a single point person on Alaska. Um, so we're going to, you know, we will have to stay in close touch with them. But you're right. I mean, I, I will say this. The $2 billion maps with the $1 billion. So it's the money is for the same kinds of things. Right. And so we're looking hard at saying you don't have to reapply and, and doing it on a rolling basis, which is what we're doing with the $1 billion. That would be helpful if, if we can just be in contact on that. And I am assuming that you are coordinating with other federal agencies, whether it's USDA yeah. or others, um, who've also got broadband funding. As again, we had a lot of tribal set aside, so how we're working to make sure that everybody's in sync yep. is we, important. We, yes, thank you. We have, so you know, Mitch Landrew is working in the White House. Uh, we have a task force on exactly this. I meet regularly with Tom Vilsack and Deb Holland. Our teams do. To, to do what you're saying. Super. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Senator Reid. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Welcome, uh, Madam Secretary. Uh, along with the uh, funding for broadband programs themselves, in the Infrastructure Act, we set aside funds for administering the programs. In fact, your 
response to Senator Murkowski about how many people you're going to have to hire underscores that. Uh, but if we have to live under a full year continuing resolution, how might this affect the rollout of the program? Yeah, thank you for the question. So in this particular program, I don't think that there will be huge disruption um, because the, you know, the money has been funded, the uh, $45 billion for the entire program. I will say, though, I appreciate the question because it would be very significantly disruptive to much of the rest of the work that the department does um, and work that you all care about. So it would, um, we wouldn't receive additional funding to support next generation of weather, climate, and space weather satellites. I know you all care about climate change deeply. We wouldn't have additional money for the desperately needed cybersecurity upgrades that the department needs and to mature cybersecurity practices across the department. We wouldn't have the money to support the 2022 economic census, the absence of which could reduce the census quality, uh, which has great impact. Uh, we wouldn't have the money to improve the National Weather Service's integrated dis dissemination program, which delivers forecasts, watch, and warning information for public emergencies. So uh, it'd be very significant and disruptive to things that in some cases are, you know, life-saving when it comes to predicting um, these severe weather events. Well, thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, there are multiple aspects of broadband. One is the technical aspect of having access to it. Uh, the other issue is being able to pay for it. And we realize in communities like uh, Central Falls and Oneyville, and I could list uh, too many more. Now he's talking my language. I know, I know. Uh, so how can programs like the Affordable Connectivity Program and the digital equity grants uh, created by the Act help low-income families get connected and make the most of these connections? Thank you for asking the question. Uh, affordability is just as important as access because what good is it to have broadband in your neighborhood if you can't afford it? What good is it if it's in the community of Central Falls but there's no hookup to your you know, housing subsidized high rise. It, it's no good. So we, uh, we are very serious about affordability. Um, first of all, every plan, every single ISP who receives any money from this must certify to us that they offer a low cost plan. And we're going to define low cost plan in a way to make sure it's really low cost. Now, the FCC has their affordability program that you mentioned, which is a $30 voucher. Mm -hmm. So as we define low cost, we know that means free for some people, so we're going to be looking at that $30 number. Um, we're going to work very closely with the FCC to get that affordability program working. We're encouraging states to advertise it. And then on top of that, as you say, um, there are the digital equity grants, I think, in a place like Rhode Island, which I happen to know very well, pretty much everyone has fiber. There's, you know, there's no rural Rhode Island. So Block Island. Okay, block, fair enough, fair enough. But, you know, relative to Maine or Kansas. But in any event, I think the money will be used for providing um, hookups to the apartment building, providing computers for kids, providing laptops, providing digital literacy skills, and so I think all of that goes to affordability in a way that will make sure this is not just accessible but affordable. Uh, finally, uh, it, quickly, uh, what should the states and other entities that are going to be beneficiaries of the program, what should they be doing now for yeah. successful applications? They should be uh, shoring up their broadband offices. You know, every state should be looking at their broadband office. They should be looking at their permitting policies to make sure that we can smoothly lay the fiber and do the construction work we need to. They should be thinking about job training programs. We're going to have to train a lot of people. We think we're going to create over 100,000 jobs um, across the country with this. They should be doing stakeholder engagement, you know, going to Block Island and finding out what really are the issues. And they should be talking to us, calling us to ask questions so we can provide technical assistance. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Senator Reid. Senator Collins. 
Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. First of all, Madam Secretary, welcome. And I want to reiterate my appreciation for your extraordinarily hard work uh, with Senator Shaheen and myself, as well, as well as other members of the committee, as we finalized the broadband provisions of the bipartisan infrastructure bill last oh, year. Oh. I think the three of us spent endless <laughs> hours negotiating, and it was indeed a pleasure to work with you. Uh, the state of Maine is ready to go, and the obstacle is an issue that's already been brought up by um, Senator Shaheen and others, and that is that the FCC must complete its overhaul of the broadband coverage maps, and that is really important because the current woefully inadequate FCC maps would lead to an inaccurate allocation of funding and overbuilding. The reason I'm concerned and signed a letter that the ranking member, Senator Moran, circulated is that the Treasury Department, which has jurisdiction over some of the American Rescue Plan broadband money, recently issued a final rule that removed a requirement that the funds be targeted to unserved and underserved areas. Can you give us an insurance today uh, that federal funds that we provided through the bipartisan infrastructure bill will be prioritized to unserved and then underserved areas? I can, I can. The, the bipartisan infrastructure law, which as you say, we worked hard to negotiate, provides a crystal clear framework uh, to prioritize unserved, then underserved. And so yes, that is the way we will do it. Also, I share, you know, you, you mentioned overbuilding. I mean, in it is vital that we first get broadband to everybody. And uh, we're going to do that so that we don't run the risk of, quote unquote, overbuilding and running out of money. Thank you. There are two other issues not directly related to this hearing, but under your jurisdiction that you probably will not be surprised that I'm going to bring up to you today. Uh, one has to do with the duties and tariffs on softwood lumber. In November of last year, the Commerce Department approximately doubled the final duty rates on imported softwood lumber from Canada, increasing the rate to 17.9%, and that applied to sales made in 2019. Just yesterday, Commerce announced an 11.64 preliminary duty rate for sales made in 2020. Now, that is a reduction in tariff rates, but I'm still concerned uh, that these high rates will hurt a lot of uh, home building in Maine and Maine businesses, many of which work very closely with their Canadian partners at sawmills right across the border. And it obviously also affects the availability of affordable housing for millions of Americans. Americans. We used to have a softwood lumber agreement with Canada. It expired in 2015. What is the Commerce Department doing to restart those negotiations and bring stability to this market? help uh, make home building more affordable for Americans and reduce tensions with Canada? Yeah, thank you for the question. I'm not surprised. I admire your advocacy. Um, so in this regard, the Commerce Department's role is relatively limited insofar as the assessment of these duties is 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 largely you know formulaic and, and mathematical and we operate in a quasi-judicial capacity applying the formula to assess the duties. I have, um, you know, reached out to USTR after our last conversation and, uh, you know, do, do support 
um, efforts to find a more lasting solution to this problem. Because, as you say, you know, whatever we do with the ABCVD cases, it's a, uh, it's all, it's temporary. I know my time has expired. I do hope we'll do a second round so that Pat, I can um, I don't have control over that, but I too hope we do because <laughs> I have some tariff questions to ask myself, and maybe Senator Collins, we can talk to the chairwoman and see if we can have uh, our trade ambassador in front of the committee before long as well. Mm -hmm. Senator Coons. And thank you, Senator Moran. Um, as you can tell, Madam Secretary, this is a wonderfully collaborative committee that's gotten a lot of good work done uh, under the leadership of uh, both parties uh, over the last couple of years. It's been a real joy to serve on the subcommittee. I'm grateful um, for your focused and effective leadership of the department at this moment of historic investment in making sure that Americans, Delawareans, Rhode Islanders, many others have access to broadband. Um, like the state of Rhode Island, Delaware has uh, areas that I would argue are genuinely rural, um, like Block Island. We have about 11,600 Delaware families that have no access to internet services, broadband at all. But we also have significant urban areas where affordability is the key issue. Um, I look forward to staying in contact with you. You raised a number of issues, permitting and the permitting process in rural areas, skills for installers, servicers, and so forth, and how we're going to update that, um, and making sure that between what uh, the department does and what FCC does, that we produce a result that is genuinely affordable. Let me just briefly ask, do you think making structural investments that reduce costs rather than providing monthly vouchers is gonna be important to ensuring affordability for the long term? I do, I think it's a combination. As I said, affordability is non-negotiable because if it's $100 a month for broadband, it might as well not exist, you can't afford it. Uh, I think it's just, it's hard to generalize because it's different in every place. Yep. So in some places, affordability fundamentally means laying the fiber and, you know, subsidizing the companies to lay the fiber in places that it doesn't exist so that it will be affordable. Well, I look forward to working with you on that. I couldn't agree more with our president's statement that the economy can't fully recover until all Americans can fully participate. Uh, as you know, developing a critical technology like broadband, making progress towards 5G and someday 6G, requires voluntary standard-setting activities and the patents and robust IP protection that underlie them to encourage investment in R&D. Uh, I want to make sure we aren't taking steps that would weaken the patent system. We've worked well together on advancing a balanced nominee to run the Patent and Trademark Office. Um, USPTO, NIST, and DOJ Antitrust have recently published a proposed revision to the existing policy on remedies for standard essential patents that I think harms our national security interests, global competitiveness, and threatens to harm the patent system. Um, I hope you can commit that, that we will ensure participation by Senate-confirmed leadership at NIST and PTO and adequate consideration of these sort of balance of equities moving forward. Is that your inclination, Madam Secretary? Absolutely. You and I have discussed this. These are complicated and vital issues. I am hopeful very soon we will have a Senate-confirmed head of the USPTO, and I think she'll be terrific in engaging with us to mm -hmm. figure this out. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Let me, last point if I can. I'm really excited that the House is taking up their version of the U.S. Innovation and Competition Act I think getting the Innovation and Competition Act out of the Senate with a robust bipartisan vote was one of the most significant things we did last year. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm particularly pleased the House version includes $52 billion in the Chips for America Fund, which would be a key boost to manufacturing and our capacity to do advanced manufacturing for semiconductors. Can you just briefly help us understand in a concrete and direct way how the passage of that bill by the Congress and the enactment of it uh, by signing into law by the president, will actually improve our ability to compete with China and strengthen our manufacturing base here at home. Yeah, thank you. I, uh, I, I cannot overestimate how important it is. Right now, the United States of America does not produce on our shores any leading edge, most sophisticated semiconductors, zero. We rely upon Taiwan for 65% of those. I mean, need I say more? Those are the chips we need in military equipment, high-end computing, communications equipment, and we are utterly dependent on one company in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So I'm out of time. We could go on extensively. I won't. It is a huge national security need, and I'm, I'm very hopeful the House 
passes it this week. I and I hope it's clarity. bipartisan. I, I hope so, too. I look forward to working with you on it, and I appreciate your clarity. Thank you. Um, Senator Bozeman is next, followed by Senator Capito, but I would guess that they're, I don't think they're on uh, appearing by technology, so I call on Senator Haggerty. Well, thank you, uh, rank, Ranking Member Moran. I appreciate that. Um, and Secretary Raimondo, it's good to see you here. Thank you for being here today. Um, broadband deployment is very important to my home state of Tennessee, uh, particularly in our rural areas, and I know that my colleagues have had many discussions with you about that. I'd like to shift then to another area that's related to that, but it has to do with our competitiveness uh, with respect to chip technology. And I hear a great deal about our chip shortage at home. Uh, I think that you are uh, an advocate of making certain that we are competitive uh, in, in that arena. And what I'd like to speak with you about is the federal regulatory burden that has to do with permitting uh, chip manufacturing here in the United States. Um, my colleagues have passed legislation that has put a significant amount of money in place to support manufacturing, but the process itself is something that's, that's quite concerning to me. Uh, when I learned about the chip manufacturing shortage, I actually undertook to call the leaders of chip manufacturers around the world. Some of them came to see me, others just spoke with me by phone. But when I asked them what stands in the way of manufacturing here in the United States, one of the greatest obstacles is the timeline for permitting here in America. And as I talked to them about it, they underscored the fact that the rate of technology development in their industry is so rapid that they can't accommodate a long federal regulatory permitting timeline. Uh, and I have a feeling that you probably feel the same way about this, that you'd like to see us have a more uh, concise, predictable, and, and uh, effective regulatory process. Is that correct? Yeah. So uh, I would, I certainly agree with you that we need to have a hard look at permitting mm -hmm. because in many cases for these sophisticated projects, it could take years and we don't have years. Mm -hmm. So I am interested to learn more and do more to see where, how we can, as you say, streamline the process. I, I think we have a great opportunity to work together. I, I heard the same thing about the process being in, denominated in years. And again, the rate of technology development just doesn't accommodate that. It makes us not competitive for exactly. these projects here in America. Uh, so I very recently introduced legislation with Senators King and with Senator Portman to expand the existing FAST 41 permitting process. It's a per federal permitting coordination program. And we expanded it to cover key technologies, including semiconductors, chips. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that the FAST 41 program has been successful in improving the federal agency permitting process for infrastructure projects. And it was recently made permanent in the infrastructure bill that just passed. And my bill will allow for key technologies like semiconductor manufacturing to fall into that same framework and, and using the existing federal program that's in place to help then deal with the permitting process. That bill just recently passed the Senate, Senate unanimously. 99 of my colleagues joined me. So I'm hopeful that it will pass the House very soon and that we'll get it to the president's desk for signature. So I, I'd love to get your commitment, Secretary, to take a look at the legislation that we're, that we're passing and hopefully get your in involvement in making yeah. it effective. I, I do commit to looking at it. It's, it sounds very interesting. I share the concern for the problem, and I will look at it and get back to you. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I, I think we will find some, some great opportunity to make some real improvements here for America. Uh, on a related topic, uh, in December of 2020, the Commerce Department took an important step to protect our U.S. national security and our economic security when it added China's Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation, SMIC is how it's uh, usually called, to the Commerce Department's entity list. That's the list that restricts foreign entities from accessing certain key U.S. technologies, as you know. Uh, the Chinese Communist Party considers SMIC to be one of China's national champion companies. SMIC's got very close ties to the Chinese military. Moreover, SMIC and Huawei reportedly may be teaming up to build a $10 billion chip fab facility. Other federal departments have noted that companies continue to export important U.S. technologies to SMIC because the entities list restrictions on SMIC are phrased too narrowly. In October of 2021, Reuters reported that the Commerce Department disclosed to Congress 188 licenses valued at nearly $42 billion that were greenlighted for semiconductor manufacturing for, for SMIC. And yesterday, Senator Cotton and I sent a letter to you urging your department to close the loophole, to, to, to broaden 
the parameters so that we can shut this loophole down and, and, and I would look forward to working with you on, on getting those loopholes closed to ensure that the entity listings really accomplish their intended purpose and prevent Chinese military access to our key technology. So I would ask you to mm -hmm. work with us uh, to, to deal with these foreign suppliers that may be undercutting this situation. May I reply? Yes. Please. Uh, so I haven't seen the letter, but I will read it Understand. Yeah. and get back to you. Um, I share your deep, deep concern with doing everything we can to deny China our uh, technologies. In fact, since I've been secretary, we've added 81 new Chinese companies to the entity list, um, and they're effective. You know, in the, in the time that we've put Huawei in the entity list, their revenue has been down by 30 percent. So I'm out of time. I will look at it, your letter, and you thank know, you for, get back uh, to you. Thank you for looking at that with, with, with us. I think we have some room to improve there. And I think if, if you look at these two steps that we've discussed, uh, making it easier to permit chip manufacturing here in America and making it tougher for China to access our technology uh, will have a very significant impact on our national security. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Schatz. Thank you, uh, Chair. Thank you, uh, Secretary, for being here. I know that you understand the unique communications challenges that Hawaii in particular faces. We are the most isolated, populated place uh, on the planet. And of course, we rely on submarine cables for connectivity um, to the rest of the country and the rest of the world. But also, we rely on submarine cables for connectivity within the state. And that's an important distinction to make as we think about definitions um, uh, in the infrastructure bill and elsewhere. Uh, and that's why Congress made sure that submarine cables are an eligible expense uh, for middle mile broadband uh, in the infrastructure uh, bill. Um, can I count on you to um, work with NTIA and my office to meet Hawaii's broadband needs, which are understandably different, but sometimes take three or four extra minutes to explain? <laughs> Absolutely, yes. In fact, I was with Governor Ige this weekend. I, I spoke to the governors about broadband, and he brought this up specifically. And I expect that this will be in Hawaii's plan through the bead pro, you know, process, but absolutely, we will work with them. Thank you very much. Um, as chairman of Indian Affairs, um, I appreciate that the department has been working hard to implement the first round of funding for the tribal broadband uh, connectivity program, but there are still challenges in pushing the money out quickly enough and with the flexibility needed for the unique needs on the ground. Uh, what have you learned from the first round and what can Congress do uh, to ensure that funds in this coming round are issued as quickly as possible? Yeah, thank you for the question. And I acknowledge that we're a little bit behind on those tribal uh, deadlines. But as I said to the chairwoman, our mantra is get it right. Um, what have we learned? Uh, we learned that we had to cure about 70% of the initial applications from, from tribal communities, which means a lot of technical assistance, and that takes time. And so we're committed to doing that. Um, we've learned how to do it. Uh, we, but, you know, it does take time, and we want to make sure if everyone's going to participate, we want to give the tribes a chance to get the money, which means we have to help them improve their proposals. Secondly, um, we've learned that you have to really do stakeholder engagement because the needs uh, and conditions in tribes are just different, and so we have to get out in front of it and listen even more. Um, I will also say on a personal level, I've learned just how heartbreaking this is. 50% of people on tribal lands have no broadband. And I've heard people tell me stories of a teacher having to get in her car and drive school worksheets once a week to the kids because otherwise they couldn't go to school at all. So we are very deeply committed to it. Thank you. And I, I, I think a couple of thoughts. First, uh, tribal consultation consultation with Native peoples because the people of Hawaii are, are, are not a federally recognized tribe but, but still have uh, 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 trust obligations under, under uh, federal law. Um, but Native consultation is the key principle here. And, uh, and it could be turned into a kind of TA, um, uh, uh, and that's fine. 
Um, but it does seem to me that the consultation on the front end uh, is, is both logistically smart, but it's also consistent with federal policy, which is to enable tribal consultation and the sort of nothing about me without me and understanding that some of these tribes uh, have extraordinary resources and no problem to apply yeah. for a yeah, yeah. federal grant. Some of them don't. Yeah. Some of them, the librarian is the sheriff, is the, you know, and, and people are trying their very best to do multiple jobs in extraordinarily difficult circumstances. So I appreciate your attention uh, to that. Um, let, let me uh, finish with, with Noah. Um, uh, uh, I really appreciate um, your passion for oceans. Uh, we share that passion. Uh, only one of us is from the ocean state. Um, uh, and so I really appreciate the, the work you're willing to do. The, the infrastructure bill has $1.3 billion over five years for coastal resilience and habitat funding. Um, if you could just give me a couple of thoughts about how you're thinking about that, and then specifically to the extent that it's infrastructure, how you're gonna work with DOT and the Army Corps and think through you know, green infrastructure, not as a slogan, but as, for instance, a better uh, coastal inundation prevention strategy mm -hmm. than some of the stuff that the Army Corps is doing in the first mm -hmm. instance, and that this idea of ecosystem services is not some pie in the sky, you know, conservationist term. It's actually a pretty smart way to manage um, risk uh, if we do it right. So could you yeah. give me your thoughts on that? To I mean, t I, you, you said it much better than I ever could. And in this respect, um, we have 18 programs related to coastal resiliency, which are vastly oversubscribed, well run through our existing NOAA offices, hugely oversubscribed. So this additional money, we plan to run through the existing NOAA program offices um, and, and meet the need that previously has gone unmet. Uh, we're targeting, you know, summer to start getting this money out the door, but it, it's, it's intended to do what you said, you know, and I did see this in Rhode Island, like resiliency and adaptation uh, and planning uh, is, you know, communities know how to do it. They do, they need our help and our money to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Schatz. Um, Senator Manchin would like to ask questions right now. He's still in an energy hearing, but they're, both Senators Collins, Moran, and myself have expressed an interest in the second round, so we'll go ahead with that, and when Senator Manchin comes on, we'll go to him for questions. Um, I would like to pick up first on the workforce question, because you pointed out you're going to need to hire over 100 people just at NTIA to administer the infrastructure um, programs. So I have heard that in New Hampshire as, we're, as communities are thinking about how to make better use of the funding that's coming in from the infrastructure proposal. And as we think about how do we get all of the the workers who are gonna do, execute the bead program? How are we gonna get the small businesses that are gonna provide the, um, the ISP um, companies that we're gonna need? So can you talk a little bit about your thinking on this and how you see us being able to ramp up to do that? Because in states like New Hampshire, that's a huge challenge. So let me try to answer it and make sure I'm answering the right question. As I said earlier, we, our numbers suggest we think we can create between 100,000 and 200,000 jobs in deploying the $65 billion. And um, that's a, across the map, you know, construction jobs, technician, technical jobs, everything that you've said. Um, as a result, we are allowing for flexibility for states to use their bead money to do, for example, apprenticeships, job training, recruiting, um, for exactly this reason. So we are encouraging states uh, and the digital equity money as well, the um, additional money. So we are encouraging states when they're putting together their plan. It's not just about laying fiber, it's about what are the workforce needs that you will have and what are the you know, worker training and other initiatives that you're going to invest in in order to meet those needs. And are you gonna be providing any kind of guidance, modeling, examples, and 
How do you envision working with the SBA, for example, who is going to be important, I would think, in helping some of those small businesses to develop, to, who can actually be in charge of hiring the workers to do the deployment? Yeah. So, again, I keep saying technical assistance, but I can't say it enough. I mean, this is going to be very... We're hiring 120 people in NTIA to do just this program. Uh, that's in addition to what they already have. That's in addition to the other resources in commerce. We are going to have to really, in a very hands-on, granular way, work with states, absolutely, provide them. We're having community of practice meetings. We're sharing best practices. We're going to loop in the Labor Department and offer guidance and help with how do you do apprenticeship programs, et cetera. Um, we've already started to do that, but it's that that will be a huge, that's what we have to do. I'm really pleased to hear that because I think that's going to be one of the biggest challenges yeah. of this program. By, by the way, I will say, um, I think there's a huge opportunity here for women and people of color because if you look at who traditionally does these kinds of jobs. Oh, absolutely. It's disproportionately not women and people of color. And so deploying this much money and creating over 100,000 jobs, it is also about equity. And I'm, I'm passionate about this piece of the work. Great. That's great to hear. I, I talked about talking to our municipal association in New Hampshire. And one of the questions that I got was, and I think maybe you and I talked about this a little bit, but that's how um, states and local governments can maximize efficiency as they're looking at the funding that's coming in. For example, we have a lot of communities that are going to be using the water and sewer money. They're going to be looking for the broadband money. They're going to be looking for transportation funding. And for a lot of those, they're going to traverse the same route. Mm -hmm. So the, their question was, how can we coordinate those activities so that we know the money's coming so we can plan to do, if there are pipes and lines going to a certain area, so that we can plan to do that digging all at once? Yeah. So this is not, this is a real challenge. Um, as I said, the president has a task force, which Mitch Landrew, uh, we meet weekly, uh, tr trying to co coordinate on our end to avoid exactly what you're talking about. Uh, and, so, and, you know, as I say, we're already meeting weekly. We're reaching out. We're trying to make it one-stop shop. Um, but it's going to – I don't think there's a silver bullet on this. I think it's a, a, about being vigilant and in constant communication with these states. And now, the que somebody asked, what can governors be doing now? This was my message to governors. Like, figure out how we change permitting now or – we don't want to be ripping up the same road three times right. in a year. You live that as governor, too. So we're asking governors to start planning now um, to avoid some of these issues. Thank you. Um, Senator Braun. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good to have this discussion. I know when I travel uh, all the 92 counties in Indiana, I hear three themes constantly. Workforce, uh, we're not here to talk about that. Affordable housing and rural broadband. And that's not to mention what I think is probably the biggest issue we should be grappling with, and it's the high cost of health care. Because in running my own company, it was the thing that ended up coming into the C-suite because it never seems to get any better. Uh, I think that's because we've got a very uncompetitive health care industry. Let's focus here. Let's focus on appropriations. Let's put a little context into the whole idea of appropriating. Since I joined the Senate, uh, we've appropriated more dollars outside of the appropriations process in this committee than within it. This includes more than $3.8 trillion we spent on a bipartisan COVID bill, $1.9 trillion on ARPA. Additionally, the infrastructure bill increased discretionary spending by $415 billion uh, over the previous highway funding baseline, adding a net deficit of $256 billion. Put this in context. When it came through 0809, we spent $800 to $900 billion. And that was a real 
systemic economic issue, and that seems like chump change in this day and age. I think the process is broken. We don't do regular order. I mean, we're talking about continuing resolutions because we have not had the ability and the political will to get this done by September 30th of 2021. I mean, it is a system that has just gone completely out of control. And I'll put one other doozy in there. Just a little over three years ago, we were $18 trillion in debt. Now we're nearly 30 And I think the American public needs to realize that coming out of World War II, the highest percentage of debt we had ever taken on as a country, we were savers, we were investors. We paid all of that off and built the interstate highway system. That seems like a big story of fiction now when we built in trillion, now close to 1.5 trillion structural deficits, largely driven by the gimmick of the biggest things we spend money on here would be not on discretionary, but non-discretionary. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, other things we so kind of ingeniously put on autopilot and don't do budgeting regular order anymore. What do you think needs to be done? Be, we need rural broadband. We'd be much smarter block granting that to the states because you know what they do? They have balanced budget amendments. You know what they do? I was on the budget or on Ways and Means and Roads and Transportation in Indiana for three years. You always make your ends meet because you're either statutorily or by constitution have to do it. I'd like your opinion, not on broadband. How do you get this back into balance? When in my three years here, so many people come to this institution wanting more and don't even realize that the worst news is down the road when the Medicare trust fund goes completely bust in four and a half years after paying into it since the 60s. Social Security in 10 or 11 years. Actuarially, we've known it all. We have no political will. I think someone in this room told me that in one of our first budget meetings. That's what we lack mostly. I'd like your opinion. You're in the midst of it. We're feeling no current pain. How do we get this institution back into a respectable place where people can count on it in the long run? Well, thank you, Senator. Um, I would say as a governor, I had to balance a budget every year and run a state every year and balance a budget. And so I um, have had that experience. I'll also say 2008, 2009, um, the economy struggled for for 10, people really struggled for 10 years after that. I was a governor in the wake of that. And for years we had to make cuts because uh, that stimulus wasn't quite big enough. And so that's why President Biden has really been leaning forward to say, let's make investments. The issue that I'm here to talk about, broadband, I don't think of it as spending money. I think about it as investing. I used to run a business too. These are investments, whether you're investing in roads or bridges and broadband, child care so women can work. These are productivity enhancing, GDP improving, worker enabling investments. I'm all for accountability. I'm all for responsibility. I'm all for transparency. But I do think we need to invest in growth. Real quickly, because uh, time has expired, uh, not by much. We generally go beyond this. But you're correct. A return on a tangible investment makes sense. But you got to remember what's driving our current deficits would not be for tangible investments like infrastructure that you're referring to. When you start making the uh, argument that an intangible investment uh, is somehow part of what we need to do, that's more what I'd call spending. You need to do some of that. Uh, the thing that kept your state's finances in order was probably your good stewardship along with some really good guardrails. And until we have that here, your job is going to be very tough. Future generations, I think, have a lot to worry about about what this looks like five to ten years down the road. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Senator Braun. Senator Van Hollen. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, welcome, Madam Secretary, and thanks nice for your to you. 
Good work. Uh, nice to see you. And uh, we appreciated uh, in Maryland Deputy Secretary Graves' uh, recent visit yeah. uh, to Baltimore, uh, where he met with uh, Maryland's four HBCUs. Uh, all of them have applied for the Connecting Minority Communities uh, pilot program, and we're working with them uh, on those uh, applications. Uh, we're also pleased that he joined us in Howard County, uh, where their Economic Development Authority put together a consortium uh, that's a finalist in the Build Back Better Regional Challenge uh, to create a cybersecurity-focused workforce pipeline. So uh, thank you for the department's attention um, on all of these um, ongoing efforts. Uh, and I was listening to your testimony. Thank you for the work you're doing on the broadband front, high-speed uh, internet. Uh, the state of Maryland is already using $300 million from the American Rescue Plan uh, for that purpose uh, around the state, as are a number of our municipalities, including Baltimore City. Uh, but the additional funds in the Infrastructure Modernization Program will help us all finish uh, the job. And I, I wanted to delve a little bit more into the affordability part of uh, access to high-speed internet, because we know you, you, you need a tablet, you need a reliable connection, mm -hmm. but you need to be able to afford it. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in many places in Maryland, a community might have a single provider uh, where services mm -hmm. are just unaffordable at the end of the day. You have a mon monopoly provider, no competition, uh, and the prices are too high for many families. And mm -hmm. uh, the Middle Mile Program can, I think, help relieve that issue. And I heard you, in response to Senator Murkowski's question, make the point that uh, a state could choose other resources in the BEAD program for that purpose. Is that right? Yes, absolutely, right. yes. And, and would you agree that if we're going to invest billions of dollars in building out our broadband infrastructure, that at the end of the day, it does have to be affordable for everybody so that we're not having to come back and provide new, fresh subsidies so people can afford the service? A absolutely. We, um, yes, as I've, I've said earlier, affordability is core. It's of no use to you or your family to have internet for $80 a month, $100 a month. Um, and we're going to have to look at that. So we are requiring competition in every in every state plan, in every state, they have to have competition. We are hoping that the money we're providing, which could be to utilities, co-ops, middle mile providers, nonprofits, will encourage more competition. We are requiring everyone, every ISP or provider who gets any of this money must provide an affordable plan. So that's key. You're not going to get anything if you don't prove to us you have an affordable plan. And then finally, we will be working with the FCC uh, and their affordability program, the, um, it used to be the EBB, the Affordable Connectivity Program, which is $30 a month to, you know, combine our efforts with their efforts. Well, thank you, Madam Secretary. And uh, your, your response um, sort of anticipated my next question. But so these funds will be available to all entities, to nonprofit entities, to public entities, uh, the private entities in order to create competition. Uh, and w for example, let's say a private entity was going to receive some of these funds. Uh, a condition of receiving these funds uh, would be to agree up front to affordable prices being charged? Yes. They will not be eligible to receive any of this money yeah. unless they first prove to us, NTIA, that they are going to be offering an affordable plan. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Um, my, my last question just relates to the uh, NTIA grants and the B grants. As you know, they're channeled through states. Um, you were a governor. You know that um, sometimes municipalities or counties in Maryland um, feel that they're not at the table when the state makes those decisions. Mm. Can you provide some assurances that the monies that flow through the states and subgranted uh, to counties that that counties and municipalities will be engaged up front mm -hmm. in that process, that it's a, um, a, a, a coordinated process, not a, a top-down process. Yeah. Yes, I can. Uh, I've also lived that. Uh, we are requiring a lengthy, extensive stakeholder engagement and requiring states to prove to us and show us exactly what that stakeholder engagement was. So first they get a 
planning grant. And with that planning grant, they have to do a, a, a certain amount of stakeholder engagement, including with municipalities, including with consumer advocates, including with ISPs. And we're going to be the arbiter of whether it was enough engagement. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Thank you, Senator Capito. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for uh, being with us here today. And thank you for your constant communication with me uh, personally as this was developing. I'm obviously really excited about it. Uh, about 10 days ago, I launched a project through my, uh, my office called Share Your Story. And I asked, in anticipation of all the money uh, uh, coming into the state uh, and uh, some of the misspent funds from the BTOP program in 2009, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. don't want to make that mistake again. I think you and I talked about that. So amazingly, I've got 902 stories. These are that from people amazing. all over the state of West Virginia that are talking about where their issues are with their broadband service. We've heard from schools. We've heard from a school superintendent who can't even conduct business at his own home. He has to go back to the school in the middle of the night if something comes up with the school system. Mm -hmm. Businesses, but mostly individuals. Mm -hmm. They fall into a packet of unserved, yes, so you, mm -hmm. you think, well, how are they contacting you? Maybe they can service at work or something like that. Mm -hmm. Underserved or service promised undelivered. You know, certain speeds promised. You're paying for this, but you're not getting it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, other things are sort of regional, where certain areas that are more rural or less uh, populous have less service or less availability. And then some providers, who I will remain unnamed, were, were highlighted in this. So um, I am planning to you use this. You could tell me later who they were. Pardon? <laughs> you, you could tell me later who those providers later. were. Um, and so I, I am planning to use this data that we're, we're recontacting everybody and uh, use this with my broadband council to help them fulfill their mapping uh, as, they're, as they're moving out. Because I, I was surprised it was such an overwhelming response and very pleased. So it's called share your www.capito.senate.gov forward slash share your stories. Um, in your, so I want to talk about something just really um, detail here oriented. You said maps by the summer in your uh, comments, uh, your written statements, you said that we prepare to launch these programs in a little more than 100 days because as we get to share our stories, people are saying, yeah, you, you've talked about how you're going to get us broadband. When mm. is this coming? Because yeah. there's such yeah, an appetite. Yeah. So could you line out a little bit more of the timeline? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just briefly, yeah. So first of all, we would like to get the info from Share Your Stories. We will. Because as I said, we are deep into stakeholder engagement at Good. the moment. Um, so listen, this, this will be a challenge because this... Here's the way it's going to work. Right now, we're doing our request for comment, at, trying right. to get what we can. We are charging towards a goal of second week of May, third week of May, uh, to put out the notice of funding opportunity. So that's kind of the starting gate okay. for the states. Mid-May, starting gate, apply. They'll let us know if they want to apply. I'm sure they all will. Then we're going to provide them with a $5 million planning grant. Mm -hmm. But the, and then they start working on their state plan. And it will take them time. It will take them months to do their state plan. They have to do stakeholder engagement. That takes months. I was with the governors the other Does day. Does stakeholder engagement have to begin in May? Can they be doing that now? They should be doing it now, but, but they'll know. They can do it now. They can do it now. Yes, they can okay. and they should. As long as they document. And exactly, exactly. But, you know, I was with the governors on Saturday, and they're like, we're ready to go now. We want our money now. I'm like. Right. respectfully or not. Have you checked this box on permitting? Have you checked this box on building out your broadband office? Have you really done consultation with the tribes and the ISPs and the municipalities? But here's the nut of it, Senator. We need the FCC to produce the maps right. before we can even run the formula to figure out how right. much money every state has. So, And I don't know. I mean, the FCC chairwoman testified to June. They're telling us summer... I hope it is summer, and if it is, then we can get to work thereafter. Yeah, I mean, obviously, sooner the sooner the better. You know that. I mean, you know the. And, but we want to do it right. We want to do it um, accurately. Um, I know there's been a lot of questions on this, and certainly in the share our stories, I saw this and I alluded to it. There are areas that are sort of in the fine line of underserved and unserved. They may have availabilities 
uh, but it's uh, you know a two hundred dollar uh, uh, a month satellite mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. availability that in the mountains of West Virginia, a lot of times people are getting kicked off or other things. Mm -hmm. So I, I was supposing that you're going to be planning for those gray areas. I think mm -hmm. Senator Moran was sort of getting to that in his question. Yeah. So, you know, we look at the speeds. Below 25.3 is right. unserved. Below 120 is underserved. Um, we're also going to rely on the governors and the local broadband offices. Mm -hmm. I mean, they know. They right. know. In West Virginia, you know. Right. Where is it spotty? Where is it insufficient? And so that's why we're asking the states to put together plans, and we're, we're relying on the states to tell us, hey, I don't care what your maps say. I'm telling you these cluster has poor service and that's why we want to use our money to connect this cluster or run fiber there yeah and a lot of the what you're talking about those technologies they probably need fiber which right. is which is what we're doing here so it's high quality right all right I think my time is up unfortunately I have about 20 more questions <laughs> thank you Senator Moran Moran <laughs> hello <laughs> ah that is Senator that is Manchin. Senator Manchin. Right. Uh, I think it's my turn. We didn't know Jane? you were. We didn't. We didn't know, know you were, were on. We didn't know you were on. I just left the other meeting to come here to be uh, on this, and it's such an important issue. And I heard Shelley talking some things, and I can take it at, uh, at the same level. But you know, we have a lot of concerns. So, is it my turn? Um. Yes. Um, we. Yes. We. Okay. Uh, wait, a wait a minute before you start. Let's see if we can figure Let's out what's going on with the system. What's going on with the system. Do we know? We know. You got it. You got it. Not yet. Not yet. Then you can. Then you can get me in. You've been hooked up for the last hour. Joe, you're on. Joe, you're on. Okay. Okay, Gene. Thank you so much. I appreciate. I, I know. I, I know that we thought we had it hooked up, but anyway. Uh, let me just, uh, uh, Secretary Raimondo, thank you uh, for being here. Let me take you back a ways and how this all came about. In 2016, October 2016, I brought Chairman Wheeler uh, because they kept telling us we were covered. I know Shelley has gone over. We both have been on top of this and trying to make this work because I couldn't figure out why they were saying, oh, no, your maps are covered. Your maps are good. You're covered in this area. So I brought Chairman Wheeler to Tucker County. And we were out at the vocational school and, and he said uh, he was there and it was shown that we had good coverage in this area uh, with the maps that the um, FCC had. So I told him at that time, I said, why don't you call back to your office and check to see if you have any message or, or whatever and just use any phone you want to or any carrier. Because it's shown that we have good coverage here and it brought to light that he knew that something was wrong. And I said, I said, Mr. Chairman, this is happening all over our state. So we started these uh, these uh, tests and we start challenging every school, every area. And it was unbelievable. I know Shelley's uh, office has done the same. It's just unbelievable the response that we received. And we start pushing and pushing and pushing these maps. And then they said they couldn't pay for the maps and they didn't really was reluctant to fix to upgrade these maps. Well, rural America was getting left behind. Rural West Virginia and Appalachia uh, was definitely left behind. So we put some things in this piece of legislation as we were working the infrastructure bill, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, to make sure that we wouldn't get left behind this time. And we said that these areas that have no coverage whatsoever ought to be the highest priority. And I just wanted to make sure that I, uh, that we're on track and that you all coordinating it with the FCC is on track to make sure that's where the first assistance is going to go and the highest need that there is in the country is in the areas that have no coverage whatsoever. And it, and, and secretary, it came more to light during the basically this pandemic than any time before. I had kids that couldn't do their homework. They fell behind. Rural America fell behind faster and further than any part of our country. We had basically our veterans who couldn't do telehealth. We had doctors who weren't getting reimbursed because they couldn't do telehealth. They were doing everything by normal landlines or cell service. So we had to get a waiver in order for them to get reimbursed for uh, for telephone health, if you will. Uh, so it's been a it's been a cadre of problems that we've had, but uh, it's said that basically there are at least 258,000 West Virginians without broadband access. But we've had estimates as high as 900,000. 
which is 50% of our population does not have connectivity or not dependable connectivity. So only thing I can say, what steps uh, are you taking in the short term to make sure that these needs are going to be met and how can I help you? Yeah, these, thank you, yeah, Senator. These, thank you, Senator. Okay, I'll, shall I just go for Okay, I'll, shall I just go for I have you, yeah. Secretary, you're on, I have you, I have you clear. Okay, well, it's great to see okay, you, well, albeit on a screen. And Senator Manchin, I think you need to mute. Try it again. Okay. It's nice to see you. Um, and it's, it's heartbreaking to listen to you talk. It's outrageous and heartbreaking. And I'm determined to work with you to make sure every single person in West Virginia, every household, every small business has high quality broadband when we're done with this work. Uh, yes, I will commit to you that this is an initiative by its design, which is prioritizing unserved and underserved. You know, underserved is maybe technically they have service, but it's poor quality service. That is the explicit focus, that is the priority, and that's where we're going to go, to the unserved and the underserved. And the reason we're setting this up so that the states are in the lead is I am a firm believer that the states know, in some cases, address by address, school by school, where the dead spots are. And so we are relying upon state broadband offices and mayors and county commissioners and governors to put together a plan to you know, tell us what they think is required in their state to provide excellent, high quality, affordable broadband. I also will say, and I, I remember saying, you, oh, go ahead. Can I just okay. chime in one time real quick? Uh, basically the FCC, uh, uh, Chairman Rosenworcel, mm. how are you all connected with her making sure and what timeline does she have on her maps? How are they doing on the maps? Because we've been speaking and everything, trying to stay on top, make sure she has the necessary funds and also the resources and uh, and help and the urgency that needs to be done. Because we can't do a thing without that. Yeah, no, no, believe me. Uh, she, she hears from me often. Uh, I've met with her. Alan Davidson's met with her. We're in constant, constant communication. She's saying summer we will have the maps. And so we're going to continue to work with her to make sure we get them as soon as we can, but even more important that they're accurate. Accurate. You know what I would ask you to do? It might, it might help, uh, ex help you all uh, determine where the, where the need is the greatest and how you can best deliver the uh, services there and funding is ask for best practices. Every state has some areas that have an area of best practice. We have some, uh, we have some uh, co-ops. We have a co-op is probably one of the better ones, not only in our state, but probably in the country. And if we can mimic that and use their expertise and what they have found, we can hopefully uh, be a little bit quicker in getting the services to the people in West Virginia. We have a higher cost of getting service in a rural area. So basically we have a uh, 10%, I think there was a 10% 10, 10 upcharge on that mm -hmm. that would allow for the higher cost in the more expensive mountainous areas, more rugged terrain, if you would. Mm -hmm. These are the type of things I think we can accelerate that and if the state, if you could let us know how the states are cooperating with you, mm -hmm. if our state of West Virginia is working with you with their broadband council, using the best practices, giving you some ideas of how we can accelerate that, they, but until the maps come back, they can tell you what's not covered right now, but I'm not sure the maps, I'm hoping the maps are going to be accurate enough to show you where the need is. Yeah, absolutely. We will work with your state. I will keep all of you apprised as to how it's going with your states. I would ask you to keep me apprised how you think it's going. You're correct. There's a 10% set aside for high cost areas, which are areas which are uh, more expensive than the average unserved area. And I expect whether it's West Virginia, Alaska, a lot of your communities will be eligible for that plus up to take into account just how expensive it is to lay fiber in these areas. Thank you very much, Senator Manchin. Um, we will now, I think the status is we are into the second round of questions. Everyone has had their first round and I've had my second round, so I will turn it over to Senator Moran for his second round. Chairman, thank you. Uh, Secretary, Secretary Raimondo, uh, thank you for the conversation we had earlier. I welcome the chance to have uh, further discussion as you suggested in regard to RDOF and what FCC may be doing that 
uh, may eliminate or reduce the likelihood of many states accessing the funds uh, from the Department of Commerce. Um, and I think you've said this, but I'm going to ask this question just so that you can say yes one more time and then I can find it in the record if I have to come back to it. <laughs> will you commit to the Department that the Department of Commerce will ensure unserved areas have access to quality broadband service before investments are made in areas with existing service? I will. Here is my commitment. I commit that at the end of this, every person in Kansas will have access to high quality, affordable broadband. And so I commit to ensuring that we're not going to spend money adding duplicative service in places uh, before making sure that everyone who's unserved and underserved is covered. A more useful answer than a yes or no response. Thank you. Be careful, Madam Secretary, because that means every state in the country is going to want that same commitment. I believe that commitment was made to Kansans. <laughs> <laughs> now, look, it's the, I can hear my staff saying, be careful, but here's the situation. This money is explicitly prioritizing unserved and underserved. That doesn't mean some of the money won't go to places that already have coverage. And by the way, that competition will bring down prices, and that's not a bad thing. But what I will commit to you is we are not going to spend money, quote unquote, overbuilding until first we are certain that everyone who's unserved and underserved has coverage. That's the whole point of the program. I might point out to my colleagues, any of them who care on this topic the way I do, the legislation that we passed altered the formula for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. It used to be 90%. It's a Moran provision in previous legislation that 90% had to be spent in places that there were no service, and we lowered that to 50%, uh, which troubled me, but we were unsuccessful in altering it uh, to return it. Let me ask just a couple of questions beyond this topic. Um, operations and maintenance. It's become clear to me, and I, I think I was slow to recognize this, the money that we generally spend, almost without exception, is to build out the infrastructure for broadband. But there's very few resources, maybe some at the FCC, that are for operations and maintenance. So what I've discovered in my, with my rural carriers, my rural telephone companies, when they build out the, this, these subsidy dollars, this assistance to, to help them accomplish that, gets the infrastructure in place, but still it's too expensive to provide the service on an ongoing basis. And I don't think anything in this legislation directs the Department of Commerce to assist in those operation and maintenance costs, but I would just raise this issue for you, Madam Secretary. There's still something else that may get us the infrastructure in place but then it be still unaffordable on an ongoing basis. And there may be something between what, I think it's at, uh, at uh, USF that may be helpful in this regard, but it may take some coordination between rural development, FCC, and the Department of Commerce to, to pay attention to one more. It would be sad if we got the infrastructure in place but still remained unaffordable to provide the, the service throughout the future years. Yeah, I will look into that, and I appreciate it. I mean, obviously, the hope here is that we're providing an enormous amount of money to help defray the cost of laying the broadband and the infrastructure, and and we're requiring the providers who receive the money to guarantee a low-cost plan. Uh, having said that, I hear what you're saying. I will also say this. Uh, please be involved in creating your state's plan. So whether it's overbuilding or making sure we get to everybody who's you know, not covered or has poor service. That's why we're designing this. You and your governor and your other mayors know Kansas better than we ever will. So I'll come to you before we approve the plan, um, and we'll welcome your feedback. Uh, that's good advice for all of us to get fully engaged in what's going on in our home states. And we, as I said, we had outreach to our director a broadband services at our Department of Commerce, and we need to make sure that we stay engaged, not just with yep. that, that moment, but into the ongoing process. Uh, as Senator Collins led the way, let me mention tariffs. Uh, you and I, and you've been very uh, caref uh, kind in your hosting an event for us to bring uh, mm -hmm. folks who are, sub who are uh, having difficulties as a result of the tariffs and high lumber prices. 
Steel prices is another example. I want to add a, a third one to the list that I've talked to you about previously. And I certainly share Senator Collins' concern about softwood lumber and housing prices and the consequence. At a time in which supply chain is so limited, it seems to me that tariffs ought not to be one more burden uh, in the cost or availability of materials uh, in this country. The one I would raise for you is um, fertilizer. Uh, ag commodity prices are higher, as uh, everything is higher these days, so the price of wheat, cattle, corn, soybeans, and all the things that we produce in Kansas are up, but so, in an overwhelming way, are the input costs necessary to produce that wheat, cattle, and corn. One of the most important components is fertilizer, and fertilizer is generally made from uh, phosphates and from natural gas, both which are skyrocketing in price. So there's not profitability in agriculture, despite what you might see about the price that a farmer or rancher might receive for what he or she raises. But we have placed, the previous administration placed uh, tariffs, uh, countervailing duties on phosphate imports from, Mos uh, from Moscow, from Morocco, and its preliminary decisions, uh, you, you've continued that. And I would again highlight at a time in which the demand for fertilizer and feeding the world. We just met with the U.S. Uh, uh, food Service Ambassador today. Uh, the demand for food, the need for food around the globe is huge and compelling. Uh, and what we can do to make sure that we produce more and feed more people is really important. And we also need to see something in the line of profitability for those who produce that food. Yeah. Uh, thank you. My time has expired. So uh, I hear you. And I'm very sensitive to this, and it's exacerbated now in light of the overall inflation and the supply chain challenges generally. So I will look at that. I, I will look at that. As I say, it's, I have very little degrees of freedom on these countervailing duty cases. Um, I have been, I'm very pleased that I was able to negotiate the end of the steel and aluminum tariffs, the 232 tariffs with the EU. And I'm hard at work trying to do the same with the Japanese and the UK um, because I, I, def I agree with you that tariffs on these inputs at an inflationary time can be difficult. But I owe you a better answer. Excuse on me for not complimenting you. Thank you for the you know, <laughs> in regard to steel and, and aluminum. And Madam Secretary, I need to depart to speak on the yep. Senate floor. I thank you for your time today. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Moran. Senator Collins. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Madam Secretary, I know that you realized you would not be able to leave here today uh, without us having yet another discussion about NOAA's right whale regulations. As you're well aware, the entire Maine delegation, our governor, the Maine Department of Marine Resources, all agree that this rule is overly burdensome, unfairly targets the main lobster industry, and will not achieve the goal of saving the right whale. In fact, NOAA's own data show that Maine's lobster industry has never been linked to the death of a right whale. A federal judge in Maine was able to block the NOAA regulations for a time and remarked that the regulations were based on what he called markedly thin evidence. And that certainly summarizes how we feel. Uh, yet NOAA proceeded to close more than 950 square miles of productive ocean area to lobster uh, fishing, and that closure went through till yesterday. It just reopened today. And now we're finding that the gear conversion that is required is simply not available. An AP story um, entitled Worries Grow as Deadline for Whale-Friendly Gear Draws Near um, quotes the Maine Department of Marine Resources as receiving numerous complaints that there simply isn't a sufficient supply of approved ropes or plastic links that are required by the new NOAA regulations. I would mention that 
over the years, the Maine lobster industry has greatly reduced the amount of rope that it uses, and they have always been great stewards of the environment. And that's why this is particularly frustrating. So the Maine delegation, along with the governor, has asked for a delay in the implementation of the gear conversion requirements from May 1st to July 1st. That would save the industry more than $7 million in lost fishing time. And um, we believe it would have no or negligible, negligible impact on risk reduction. Um, the overall scarcity of this gear is making it virtually impossible for many lobstermen to uh, find it. It's just simply not available. So with the implementation date still at May 1st, and that is coming up quickly, lobstermen are struggling to find the compliant gear in the marketplace. Will NOAA reconsider delaying the requirement? Hmm. So thank you for the question. And as I've said to you before, I take this very seriously, and I, I admire the way you keep, keep with it. Uh, we have many thousands of people in Rhode Island who make a living as commercial fishermen, and I know it's more than just a living. It's often been in their generation, in their family for generations. They did it, their father did it, their grandfather did it. So it's a culture, it's a way of life, and it's a living. And I understand that and want to work with you to find a solution. I wish I had an easy solution here. Uh, NOAA is not permitted on its own to change the date from May 1st to July 1st. Um, I have looked into it, and under the APA, we, it's not, we don't have that ability to, on our own, change the date. I will tell you, uh, my head of fisheries, Janet Coit, it, I have directed her to be on this, and she is talking to the commissioner in Maine almost daily. She spoke with him today. I received an update. She'll be speaking with him tomorrow. We are trying to help locate the gear as well as provide as much flexibility and assistance as we can. So let's, let us continue to work on it a bit more um, to, to see if we can alleviate these supply chain issues and just continue to kind of work on that problem uh, in the weeks ahead. And I will, I will call you and keep you apprised. Thank you. This is a terrible problem for our state. And it just seems so unfair when our lobster men and women are not the problem. Ship strikes are a problem. There, there are some problems with Canadian snow crab gear, for example. But we're not the problem. And as you've rightly said, uh, lobstering is an iconic industry in our state. It is a way of life. It's multi-generational. Our lobster men and women have always been extremely sensitive to the environment and good stewards of the resource and is extremely frustrating. I, I, I share the frustration. It's complicated, as you know, with the subject of a lawsuit, and it's, there is not a simple solution, but I will commit to you to stay on it and see if we can um, do everything we can to help the lobstermen. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Collins. The New Hampshire lobster industry also appreciates that. <laughs> um, Madam Secretary, today we had four 14 members of our committee here. That's, I think, a record for a hearing, and it speaks to the interest and urgency people feel about broadband and mm -hmm. how that funding gets done and how we get help for our community. So thank you for your commitment and for your efforts to ensure that this program works as well as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. um, if there are no further questions this afternoon, senators may submit additional questions for the official hearing record. We request the Department of Commerce responses to those 
questions within 30 days. Um, and now the subcommittee stands in recess, subject to the call of the chair. Thank you. Thank you.